Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine and today I was joined by Alex Stewart. We've taken a slightly new approach this week. The podcast is obviously out on a Monday as usual. It's slightly later because we recorded it this morning and Alex and I took a look back at the weekend of Premier League football that's just gone by with a sort of tactical impetus from our perspective. Today we spoke about the Manchester derby and the surprising result there. We also talk about Arsenal Southampton, an improvement for Southampton in front of goal and also the grit and determination of the Arsenal side to see it through. But we speak more broadly about Arsenal and whether their identity is still what it once was. We also spoke about the Chelsea-West Ham game, touching on West Ham and a vital point for them as they move towards Premier League safety and also looking back on a season that hasn't gone brilliantly for Chelsea in the aftermath of their victory last season and the potential reasons for that. Well, anyway, I do hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you very much for downloading it. And uh, without further ado, here's the jazz flute. Okay, let's start with uh, Manchester City, Manchester United, Alex, which was probably uh, the big game of the weekend, although it's uh, insignificant shone through in the end uh, to all but to all but uh, a portion of football fans from the country. Going into the game, Manchester City were 16 points ahead and they required a win to secure the uh, the Premier League title, uh, which of course symbolically would have been Lovely for them to do against their cross-city rivals. Um, it wasn't to be, though, Alex, despite the fact that at 45 minutes, it looked an awful lot like it was to be. Yeah, it looked wrapped up at that point, didn't it? Um, Let me be more specific then. How about that? It's, okay. a, ta- it's a tactics podcast. Um, they looked uh, Manchester United uh, looked terrible in the first half and uh, looked great in the second half, vice versa for Manchester City. Was there any specific uh, tactical switch uh, that enabled this change? I think the main difference was um, something that that's Manchester United seem to have struggled with slightly bizarrely, I think, all season, which is is how to use Paul Pogba. Um, Pogba's obviously an extraordinary talent in a variety of different ways, not not just his passing and creativity, but his ability to drive forwards with the ball and his um, physical presence. And it seemed like in the second half where... We've talked before about how Manchester City's um, typical attacking position is is to have four players pushed very forwards, um, two quite wide, two quite central, and then one player tucked in behind them as the sort of controlling passer. And that's that's quite often to Kevin De Bruyne. um, David Silva is playing quite uh, centrally ahead of him. Fernandinho just dropped way back, kind of protecting everything. And this obviously commits a lot of players to the attack. Now, United have tended to be more, um, shall we say, prosaic in the way that they move the ball forwards. And um, certainly Matic is a sort of Fernandinho. There are obviously differences to those two players. But a lot of the um, effort has been about getting the ball up to Lukaku with with direct vertical passes or or trying to create overlaps from fullback to get a cross in. And what United did in the second half was they actually attacked more like City. Now, they don't have, to my mind, the, the same quality of quick interplay and quick passing and, and kind of positional play as Man City do. But by releasing Pogba and uh, sort of effectively, you know, having Matic playing in that sort of slightly withdrawn role and and what was happening quite often was that Sanchez was dropping in, tucking inside and and being the person who was moving around and trying to look for openings while the other players were pushed up. They had a greater attacking potency. Um, and what you saw from the, the goal that Pogba sport scored from Herrera's chest down, which was a beautiful goal, uh, was that Sanchez had dropped back in uh, and actually, you know, you, you're too outer central midfielders were effectively the two players furthest forwards and that's not the sort of attacking intent that we've seen from Manchester United especially often well let uh, let me ask you this do do you think it was um totally as a result of the context do you think that at half time the players looked at the position that they were in and realized they had 
you know, almost nothing to lose in a way. Do you, and, and, and also, do you think that Jose Mourinho instructed this change? Or do you think that this is the sort of thing that uh, Paul Pogba uh, and co maybe took on themselves? That's a really, really interesting question. And something that, that Chris Smalling apparently said was that at half time. Um, Mourinho said, you, you you don't want to be the clowns sat there while they're lifting the title, which somebody on Twitter observed was was more or less what he'd said um, in that uh, Chelsea-Liverpool game where uh, Gerrard slipped. Um, so, yes, I think motivation almost certainly plays a, a part in it. What degree it is that the, the players take responsibility for that is uh, it's a question that you can't answer unless you're in the dressing room and I remember from last weekend um, when Spurs beat Chelsea 3-1 away and Chelsea were defending very deep and causing Spurs problems when they were trying to play in between the lines Ericsson dropped back and, and on match of the day they were talking about you know is is this something that that Ericsson kind of instinctively did in the last 10 minutes of the first half, and then Pochettino said, OK, stick with it. Was it an instruction that was shouted from the touchline? And I think the really good players are the ones who are able to assess the situation that's in front of them, see what those problems are, and then set about solving them. And Pogba's instinct is to be that dynamic. And I think one of the issues that United have had is when they play him in a midfield two, um, he he just isn't able to get as far forward as often because he has defensive responsibilities, which is quite understandable. Well, Um, unless unless, I mean, you you say that, but then we talk about the Manchester City team. We talk about the idea that they have, let's say, they do you know start off playing with a midfield two uh, of of De Bruyne and uh, and Fernandinho as an example. Um, but you know, at points throughout the game, uh, they have five players way up the pitch, and it's just Fernandinho left in the middle. Uh, what's what's preventing Man United from sort of uh, uh, copying uh, the City star, with the, with the exception of the obvious answer being Mourinho? Um, I'd say that they're they're probably not as comfortable on the ball, particularly at the back. Um, you know, a lot of what allows City to press that high is or push those many players up the pitch is that the defensive line is pushed very, very high as well. With Edison sweeping in behind, you've got centre-backs that are extremely comfortable on the ball. You've got full-backs who are able to push up and inside in order to supplement Fernandinho's midfield position should the team that they're playing counter-attack. So it's it's not just that the, you know, the, the, the City defence sit back, Fernandinho's in this kind of ocean of space on his tod and then... City have got five players up the pitch. It's much more artfully constructed than that. And and to be able to play that style of football, that that um Schwager de position which people talk about Pep doing, you know, the creating those overloads um in the half spaces or the wide spaces and moving the ball in a certain kind of way, you know, that takes a huge amount of practice and a huge amount of time. It's exactly the same as Jurgen Klopp's Gagan pressing style. You know, you can't you see a manager who's got a reputation for getting his teams to play a certain way. They're very good managers. They come to the Premier League and it doesn't work in their first season. And that's because they're trying to get the players to play in a in a different style to what they're accustomed. Now, with, with Man United, Mourinho doesn't really have a tactical style in the same way. As we've talked about before, he's, he's more reactive. Um, he's kind of at his best when he's when he's making tweaks to counter what the opposition are doing and and getting players to buy into that. Now, in this instance, you, you sort of look at, at what happened in that game and say that it's entirely possible that actually the players kind of took charge of that situation themselves, that, that Pogba, who is this extraordinarily dynamic character as well as anything else, thought essentially, you know, screw this, I'm, I'm not having, you know, I'm not having City do this to us. And kind of took the onus upon himself to to push up. Now, I'm not saying that that's that's guaranteed to be true and it is it's instructive that this kind of vault fass occurred after half time. Obviously that means that Mourinho had a period in the dressing room with the players and could have issued new tactical instructions as well as motivating and and probably 
you know, shouting at them quite a lot. Um, but I also think that the that, that big players will, by virtue of their quality, they will assess what these problems are, what the vulnerabilities that the opposition is showing are, and, and work out how to adapt to that to maximise their own opportunities. So I, I, I think it's unlikely that it's just what the manager did, although I suspect he also must have had a hand in it. Well, let, 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 let me ask you this then. Uh, do you think that it's a shame um, to, to... Or do you think it's a waste uh, to, to have players like Paul Pogba, for example, when, when we see so little of uh, what we saw in, in the last 45 minutes of the game against Manchester City, playing under managers like Jose Mourinho, do you, do you think that you could achieve more uh, with that Manchester United team with a, a different sort of coach? Uh, or do you think that that's, you know, I mean, that they have 71 points in the league, they're firmly second, they could, they're still in the FA Cup. You know, it's obviously... It's not. It's not been a bad season, I suppose. Just in the context of Manchester City season, it has been bad. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's very true. And I, I think one of the things that happens when one team is so dominant in the league um, is that it does. It, it it skews the perception of everybody else's performance. And United, you know, that yes, they're going to be second, and that's. I guess a shame for Man United fans, but it's a significant improvement on their overall kind of performance since Ferguson left. It's it's definitely um, you know if they pick up maximum points from their remaining games, then they'd be on course for the sort of total that would comfortably win them the Premier League in almost any other season. So it, it yes, it, it it skews how you look at things. I mean, you know, a, a Man United season, particularly with the amount of investment they've put in, they are not going to view it as successful and, unless they win something. And, and to be fair, I mean, Aspilicueta yesterday talking about Chelsea's season said, you know, the FA Cup isn't going to save our season. Um, and I think, you know, people talk about the sort of big club mentality at its best. That is not being satisfied with anything less than the Premier League or the Champions League. Um, and so, you know, there'll be aspects of, of United who are thinking, eh, this, this has been a failure, despite the fact that that's very much a contextual failure. Mm. Well, I guess it, it always seemed to me that one of the benefits of uh, winning the domestic trophies, even if they are uh, sort of perceived to be of a lesser value, which, which you know, let's be honest, they are. Uh, firstly, you get a little bit of extra money. Uh, and secondly, I think it creates uh, an atmosphere within the team itself which might prevent players from leaving who may otherwise do so you know i think there's a certain a certain uh, atmosphere you engender if uh, if you win a trophy however however insignificant it is uh, the final thing i want to talk about w- with regards to this uh, specific game alex is I-, I want to ask you about manchester city then because I I don't think it's fair to just say that Manchester United uh, changed up and pushed Paul Pogba forwards in the second half and that, you know, that made the difference. I think we have to, almost to be fair to City in a way as well, um, say that they capitulated because they they did. You know, I think there was, they looked a little bit nervous in the second half. Manchester United scored that first goal um, and then all of a sudden... Uh, the atmosphere was completely different. Uh, was was that just a, a a potential mental fragility that had been exposed in Manchester City? Do you think there was something that had been exposed uh, against Liverpool a few days earlier, and maybe that's you know part of, part of the same ongoing process? Or was there some tactical vulnerability that Manchester United and Liverpool tapped into? Maybe the same, maybe different ones. What what do you think it was, and why do you think they capitulated in the manner that they did? Oh, that's a lot of questions. I think, um, it, look, City are are tactically, by and large, the same in in most of the games that they play. They they don't really, they, you know, they they may make personnel changes for specific reasons. In this instance, obviously, you know, they they didn't start with De Bruyne, they didn't start with Aguero, they didn't start with Jesus or Walker, so they were missing a number of their kind of. Um, I don't want to say bigger players, but perhaps some of the experience and some of the leadership. Um, you know, De Bruyne is, he certainly appears to be quite a kind of quiet and self-effacing guy, but there's no doubt that on, on the pitch he is a leader for that side, by example, if if by nothing else. And, and so you do wonder whether to a degree having 
you know, having uh, fewer of those bigger, more experienced players on the pitch when things started to become difficult may have had some effect. Um, well, so, so we know from the Liverpool game, for example, that it was, um, you know, heavy pressing of Fernandinho in particular uh, that, uh, you know, gave gave Liverpool a little bit more space to play. In this instance, with Pogba moving forwards, what effect would that have had directly on the City team? Would that mean that the the fullbacks had to, the inverted fullbacks had to stay in field more? Would that mean that uh, one of Manchester City centre backs would have to pull back? Would that mean uh, that David Silva spent more time back in the middle of the pitch where he wouldn't usually have? How did that affect City um, as an offensive team? Well, I think that that's the key point tactically is that in order to uh, and we we talked about this in the the. Champions League preview video that we did um, for Liverpool Man City is the the two responses, well, the overwhelming response to Man City this season by teams has been to sit back, to minimise the amount of space uh, between the midfield line and the defensive line, to bring that defensive line back as close really to the penalty box as possible, and maybe leave one, possibly two players up and, and look for kind of counter-attacking balls on the break. What Liverpool did so successfully was to invert that entirely and say, no, actually, the way to counter Man City is to deny them space and to deny them the opportunity to pass and to hassle them relentlessly. And I think there's, there is a degree... like Man, Man United are not as good at pressing as uh, Liverpool are. And they didn't have quite the same degree of press and they didn't have quite the same, I think... I would say intelligence of press as as Liverpool did, you know, in targeting particular players, targeting passing lanes, stuff that we talked about in this video. But what they did do was was not sit back. And by by pushing men forward, what you do is is you ask the opposition either to I mean, in the case of City, potentially ignore the fact that you've pushed men forward. And, and rely on City's own ability to keep the ball and to work the ball into the half spaces um, and, and kind of bypass those players tucking in to the central space. Or you're asking City to adapt and, like you say, pull a player back for kind of a marking role or, or whatever it is and, and adjust their shape. And I think that's the... If you have the players and you have the the game plan then it, it's been shown that City can be disrupted in that way. I think I think a lot of the reasons that, that the majority of teams sit back and defend against City is is they're not used to that degree of pressing, they don't have the personnel, and so it doesn't make any sense. It's it's not that teams are just generally kind of you know bad and want to sit back and and want to try and soak up pressure it's that it doesn't make any sense to massively disrupt your game plan and do one thing against the best team in the league that you've not done against any other team that's senseless united liverpool maybe chelsea are there's a small number of teams whose players are good enough that you can ask them to change a little bit and say, actually, okay, I know what we normally do, but in this game I want you to press much more aggressively. I want you to really close down on Fernandinho. I want you to really make these driving angled runs in between Fernandinho and Gundogan towards the centre-backs to try and pull them out of position. And and a lot of teams won't have the players to do that, but but you know, Man United and, and particularly Paul Pogba and Sanchez drifting inside, they they did, so it worked for them. But I'm I'm definitely not saying that you know, like a, a Swansea or a, a Brighton should suddenly start throwing men forward against Man City. I think that would be stupid. Yeah, yeah. OK, uh, well, listen, let's move on to, to another uh, another game now. Um, significant two for one of the teams uh, for Southampton. This was Arsenal-Southampton. Um, Arsenal, of course, made a series of changes uh, for this game. I think they have their quarter-final uh, Europa League match against... Um, uh, Moscow, I think it is, uh, coming up on Thursday, uh, through which I think they they want to be 2017-18's Manchester United. Alex, I think they you know, probably have their eyes set on the Champions League qualification via the Europa League trophy. 
so they had a, a sort of, a, you know, arguably weakened team out against Southampton, who uh, have won one game in 19. How, how pleasing for them. And of course, as we know, uh, and we talked about last week, although that episode never made it to air because I accidentally deleted it, uh, Southampton uh, have been struggling for goals, mainly. It's in front of goal that they've been struggling. And uh, in this game, it looked slightly better for them, didn't it? Because they scored two, albeit they conceded three, Alex. Yeah, um, it's <laughs> so I'm a Southampton fan, as as possibly regular listeners will, will be aware. Um, and this was a much change Southampton side in terms of uh of lineup and style to uh the game against West Ham where we played a sort of 442 with inverted wingers um which just looked all at sea um Mark Hughes reverted to a 3421 in this fixture and Southampton have used three at the back on occasion this season and on occasion last season so they're not they're not totally unused to it. Um, it's very much, and it was in this game, um, uh, a three at the back that really reverts to uh, a five at the back when defending. And it was noticeable how deep Southampton went and also how the the the, the position, the, the, the lines of five and then four with Shane Long on his own up front were actually really well organized. Um, and, you know, they seemed well drilled. They, they, they press Southampton sensibly. So generally speaking, you'd have the five and then the four and one of the four, usually Hoiberg, who I thought had an excellent game would, would rush forwards to kind of press the man in possession along with Shane Long and then drop back. And yeah, it looked it looked a lot more solid. Um, like you say, goals have been the issue. And Long's finish to start with was nice. Um, I think I think it's one of... it. The reason I think it was an instructive game is it, it actually kind of relates to what we were talking about with, with City, is that Southampton's game plan was very, very overtly to sit back, frustrate, and, and use... Long's ability, his pace and his willingness to, to kind of run the channels to, to try and get an outlet ball as and when they could. Um, and it it's a frustrating style of football to watch because you can see very clearly what the plan is, but it, it relies on not getting yourself into a position where you're just sitting there and soaking up pressure constantly. Uh, and Arsenal, you know, had long extended periods of possession where they were playing it around in front of the the Southampton box, and there, you know there wasn't really anything that Southampton could do to to frustrate them. And I think the the problem with only having one player left up is that uh, y- you know you end up basically giving away possession most of the time that you clear it because that player is not capable of holding on to it. And and the two players who are playing off him, James Ward Prowse and Duzan Tadic were, they're not the quickest and they, they weren't really able to get up um, in support all that much. So, well, also I know that uh, Southampton obviously have had a, uh, a bit of a goal drought this season. I believe it's 31 uh, across all competitions, which at this point in the season is, is less than one per game. Um, but uh, James Ward Prowse, you mentioned there, uh, it seems to me, and this is, of course, to the untrained eye, Alex. Seems to me that he's always existed in a little bit of a of a goal drought uh, uh, because he's not <laughs> he's not much of a goal scorer, is he? But he's a no. fi- he's a fine young player. Hmm? He's <laughs> yeah, no, he's a very good player. He he he's he seems better at scoring for the England under twenty ones than he ever does for us. Sure, he's, he scored a couple of great goals for them. Yeah, um, he takes you know an awful well, he certainly has. In, in particular games when there are preferential players, takes a lot of free kicks. Uh, you know, well, his of, his set pieces. pieces are excellent. I mean, mm-hmm. I I was kind of yeah, I was, I was watching this game and getting increasingly frustrated with Tadic, who is a very creative player, but he gives the ball away quite a lot. He seems, I think, he's the kind of player that you you find room for in your side if you're not scrapping it out for relegation. But I think we looked a lot better when when Austin came on um and it would almost be tempting to to have Ward Prowse playing in behind 
Long and Austin together, you'd still have Romeo and Hoiberg as as the you know a very strong kind of pivot um, in the midfield, supported by the wing backs. And Suarez does always look more comfortable as a wing back than as a a, a pure full back because his defending is is not the best. Two assists for the day. Two assists for the day, but also you know defensively caught out for Welbeck's header um, quite badly. So I think you know to 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 try and push him forwards, um, have that solidity, and then Ward Prowse, who is a creative player rather than a goal scorer. You know when you've got when you've got Ward Prowse, Tadic, and Long as your front three, you're you're not going to score a lot of goals um, because you know they they just don't. I mean Shane Long, that was his first goal. In in the period of time that seems almost biblical, so yes, yes, um, but yeah, and Arsenal, Arsenal looked really good in parts. Um, yeah, let know. me ask you about Arsenal because uh, they've obviously, you know, it seems like they've been edging towards a season like this for a while. Mm. In that they are firmly sixth. They they really, I mean, for a while they really weren't that far away from uh, said the seventh placed team. Let's say. Um, and I think Arsene Wenger's, you know, uh, job has been under scrutiny as it always has. Uh, they're still doing, they're still performing well in, in, in the Europa League, and perhaps that's uh, something uh, which can, you know, as I said earlier, uh, see their way through to the Champions League as a result of that. Um, but it, it seems like it's the impression that I've got from their team and from and from the way that they set up almost has been that it's kind of all over the place in, in, in recent weeks and that I feel like there isn't a consistent identity at Arsenal in the way that there once was. And maybe, you know, maybe that's unfair and maybe the reason that I feel like that is because Arsenal are one of those clubs that have had such a consistent identity for such a long time that as soon as they step uh, away from that slightly, it seems all askew. Maybe that's what's happening. But what what is your impression of what's what's been going on at Arsenal this season and indeed, you know, for the last couple of years as well? Yeah, I think, I think it's. Uh, I mean, when when you say an Arsenal identity, I think we all we all know what you mean by that, which is a sort of very quick interchanging style of play, um, built on a back four with skillful individual players who somehow kind of contribute to this lovely slick quick triangle based movement forwards you know the 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 adage about Arsenal always trying to walk it into the goal etc etc I think I think they still have the capacity to play that way and and I think even actually at times against Southampton they played that way um I thought well, they, way... they certainly still buy players to play that way I mean you know that that that, that, yeah. that seems like that outward that outward look but I just don't. I just don't see it in the same way. I I think it's because they're not doing it as well, and and I think a lot of their issues, as seems to have been the case at Arsenal, for significant periods of time now, are the the lack of really convincing central midfielders that have particular roles. So, you know, in in this instance, the balance was maybe more towards the kind of sensible one, where you'd have Al Neni as the kind of um, ball winner you know shuttles backwards and forwards a bit and Xhaka is is released to be a bit more of a playmaker which is what he is Xhaka is not a kind of ball winning defensive midfielder he is he's a creative player um but I still don't find either of those players especially convincing um uh, I think Jack Wilshire on his day can still you know do something he's he's still very good at, at at carrying the ball in tight spaces around the edge of the box um as kind of as a as a number 10 but you know Iwobi stepped into that role and and got two assists and, and played superbly well um Wilshire's main contribution was in getting Jack Stevens sent off so th- there doesn't seem to be I, I'm not sure that I agree with you in so far as saying that they they have lost that identity i think i think effectively they retain the players in the front four positions to play that way what they don't have is a convincing pair of central midfielders to really facilitate that happening in the way that they used to um you know i mean they've had some great central midfielders in in recent years there and it's not you you look at who they're 
putting in that possession now and you, it's just not the same um and the, and what that does is it means that there's a say a greater onus on you know on the wider players defending back there's Iwobi has to drop in more there's less verticality there's less I think Arsenal when they're at their best they're really incisive right they they make their mind up bang 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 goal and and that only happens once it transitions into that front four getting it to that front four can appear really ponderous uh, at times and and I think that's where they're losing that impetus and they're losing that ability to to move the ball around very very quickly and and hit teams with those sorts of passing moves that are just unstoppable when they're at their best okay okay let, 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 let's have a quick word on Chelsea West Ham next uh, because I think it was an important game for two reasons firstly I think it uh, went a little bit of an extra way uh, to uh, to to help West Ham's bid for safety they're now uh, I believe six points off the relegation zone. Um, but secondly, it basically solidified the fact that Chelsea aren't going to finish in the top four. They're now ten points behind Tottenham, um, and they're currently in fifth place, which is quite a gap, isn't it? And it's something uh, you know that last last season we never would have imagined. Um, what what's the problem for 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 Chelsea? And um, no, that's it. That's it. What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, I think the first thing to say is that if you look at that top four of the Premier League um, table, they are the best four teams. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any there's any argument that over the course of the season, those teams, when I say best, I mean best to watch, really. Um, apart from Manchester United, who've not always been great to watch, but have have been very good. And um, So I don't think, I think, Chelsea and Arsenal, who are the two that are going to be disappointed about not being in the top four, can really quibble with that. Conte, after the game, said, you know, this is sort of typical of our season. You know, we we play some pretty stuff and we create chances, but if you don't score, you don't win. Um, And obviously, Morata had two very, very good goals, good as in the sense of how they were created, ruled out correctly for offside. Um, Chelsea just don't seem to have quite the same level of it's it's difficult to say so when i watched this game the thing that struck me was was partly how good Morata, hazard and willian are as a front three and partly how chelsea's only real game plan seemed to be you know fabregas finding the passing angle vertically to get the ball to those front three who then did a series of tricks and flicks and back heels and quick <laughs> right. passes to to create the opportunity for Mata to get called uh, for Morata to get called offside and and like it, it's quite exhilarating to watch that that Chelsea front three when they're playing well but it also means that you can effectively isolate them if you deny uh, Fabregas the opportunity to pass vertically towards those guys so that they have a little bit of space to start running at you, which you do not want particularly Eden Hazard, then all they can really do is go wide. And Moses and Alonso seem to have lost a little bit of the incision that we saw from them last season. So... I think it's easier now to, uh, like when Chelsea did so well last season, one of the reasons was that they started using a formation that people hadn't yet really got particularly used to and needed to adapt to. And and I think people have kind of figured out now a little better how to deal with a 3-4-3. And I think that while they still have extraordinarily talented players and in Eden Hazard, you know, arguably the best player in in the Premier League that's not at Man City. Um, It's if you stop the supply to them by stopping Fabregas, like it's not going to come from Kante. It's only rarely going to come from Alonso or from Moses. Um, And for those players to, to work well with the attacking three, what they need to be doing is pushing up and then cutting inside and looking to create those same sorts of quick passes in an area, in, you know, 
sort of in front of the defensive line, so there's a bit of space to run into. It's very rare that you know Moses bombing down the line, crossing it in, will find Morata who can head it in. Now, yes, that does happen, but it's not Chelsea's preferred style of play. So I think they're in that curious position, maybe a little bit like Arsenal, where they have the capacity in in the final third still to be absolutely exhilarating. But it's a lot easier to prevent the ball from getting there than it was last season. Um, maybe that's because last season they also had Matic, who was able to create those sorts of passes. Um, and, you know, Fabregas is, is looking a little bit leggy, possibly. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's just... I think it's. I think it is very similar to Arsenal. I think it's one of those things where you can, you can see how it should all work, but you're not exactly surprised when it doesn't always. No, and I think that that that's what interests me about Chelsea. Actually, for for me, they occupy this position as a team that doesn't seem to improve over, over a process. You know, I think in a short space of time, last season, for example, under uh, Conte, when three at the back first came into fashion. They were they played uh, amazingly well, and and I think that whilst other teams couldn't work out how to um, how to combat this system, they dominated the league, and they certainly have uh, the quality of players to do that. However, it's no surprise to me that this season it's a slight slight surprise that they're as far off the mark as they are, but it's no surprise that they haven't won the league. It's no surprise that they're not building upon that process because that seems to be the way that that Chelsea. Uh, have existed, you know, in the last sort of ten, fifteen years, and as a as a sort of form of short termism, you know. And one of the interesting things about the club now is how the approach from the top down is changing, and how you know, I think uh, Roman Abramovich has has seen really that throwing an awful lot of money at transfers isn't necessarily the right way to build a team for the long term. You know, I think this season is a good example of that, and so he is committed to spending a little bit less money at the club that's not to say that there isn't uh, going to be money still spent but there are a lot of reports that, that suggest that he's committed to spending less than he ordinarily would have uh, even to the potential extent that and this is a this is a rumor which i have uh, read in a couple of newspapers and on the internet but it's an interesting one nonetheless even to the extent that antonio conte has one season left on his contract and he might be allowed to <laughs> see that out which for Chelsea is very unusual um, and you know at this point you're sort of sitting around uh, and waiting for him to be sacked at the end of the season because that's what Chelsea do right but and you know it's by the sounds of it um, to avoid paying a uh, compensation he may be allowed to stay for another season that's that's if he wants to stay for another season sure. um, I, I mean I think yeah look transfer wise if you look at the the squad that that was against West Ham, you know Giroud's come in, which is you know kind of a Batshuayi. Let's odd just say signing. that as well. Um, well Who, ba- who's gone out on loan? Batshuayi's on loan at Dortmund um, and doing extremely well for them. Um, so you know that's that's perhaps a slightly curious decision there. But otherwise, you know. <laughs> Emerson Palmieri is a kind of utility wing back. Um, Bakayoko has not really taken off at all, despite being a player of, I think, some potential. Drinkwater is not fitted in at Chelsea. So, you know, it's it's not like you're seeing that squad freshened up, either in terms of the system that they're using, which is... It is different from last season in the way that Hazard's playing, but it's not otherwise massively different. And it's not been freshened up with exciting signings. It's, you know, it's basically not that dissimilar to what what we had last season. And yeah, I can understand why if you've got something that really worked, then you might think that it's a good idea to stick with it. But you still need to inject some sort of energy into that. And you still, I think, need to accept the fact that if you radically change your system in a way that catches everyone on the hop last season, it's not going to do the same. This, So, you know, you either need to change your system or you need to, to change something around the personnel and and create a, a kind of a new vibrancy there and it, it just 
It's well, let just me, let me full ask you this flat. question. Let me ask you this before before we finish. Um, I, I think this is an interesting question, Alex. David Louise, of course, is is injured and has been for large parts of the season. Um, he plays as a, a centre back. We all know that, but. Uh, we've talked, you and I have talked before and in a couple of videos about the impact he makes on the team from an attacking point of view and from a passing uh, point of view. Uh, is not having David Luiz in the team uh, a problem for Chelsea? How, do you think that has affected them going forwards, as odd as that might sound? Uh, no, I don't think it sounds odd at all. Um, I One thing I would quickly say is I, I, I did sort of forget the signing of Morata, who has actually been quite good, but... We'll, we'll gloss over that. Um, look, Cahill is not able to bring the ball out in the same way. And the reason that's important for Chelsea is that in order to transition the ball effectively, you, you really want to have more than one passer in either in central midfield or in that position moving the ball upwards to create the the long diagonals out towards the wing backs or the long verticals forward towards the front three. Like we said, if you can if you can squash Fabregas and stop him doing that, then they're never, they're not going to drop Kante, right? So they're not going to have two passes. They're not going to play Fabregas and drink water together. So it needs to be supplemented by that um kind of libero character stepping out from the the back three and able to do that. Andreas Christensen, the the young Danish centre back, has been doing that quite well, but he's I think he's a very elegant defender. I think he's got a lot of potential, but he's not he's not at that level quite yet. I think, and what Louise gave them was uh, an additional dynamism, an additional unpredictability in yes, albeit from a defensive position, but changing the focus of the attack, bringing it out. And and being able to switch the play around and, you know, all of a sudden, instead of thinking the ball is comfortably with Chelsea's back three and they'll play it around a little bit and Fabregas will drop in and blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden, it's with Victor Moses who's bombing down the right and, and Williams making a run into the, the half space and, you know, problems. It, that hasn't happened. Um, and I do think you're right to say that that has been a significant factor in their attacking play, because because you you can't just have one passer of the ball in in your kind of deeper half of the pitch. It it becomes hugely predictable. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's interesting, isn't it? I like that. I like that idea that a defender uh, prohibits the attack. <laughs> um, right, uh, Alex. Thank you very much for for joining us. We'll see you again uh, next week for this more of the same. Lovely. I look forward Lovely. to it. All right. Thanks. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.